Greetings and salutations, everybody. I am your liege and master of royal reviews. Or rather, I am an amateur newbie YouTuber trying to get views. Hey, as I always say, I am brutally honest. Anyway, today, as you can see, I am doing a mod review for the game Mountain Blade Warband. This current mod that you're looking at here is called Parisno. Now, this mod is fantastic. The game is incredible. The mod is incredible. I've been following this particular mod for a few years now and only seen it improve time and time again. Now, obviously, it does have its own problems. You know, it's got its glitches, its crashes, its freezing, and still feels rather incomplete, to be honest. But from looking at it, you wouldn't really be able to tell, especially now. Now, I don't, I don't know if this mod is actually finished or not, but from what I can see, it is indeed finished and just needs some fine-tuning, or maybe it's just that the mod developer stopped, you know, making updates to it, especially with the new Mountain Blade 2 that's coming out soon and the mods that are possibly going to be available for that one. So this mod does still freeze up a little, you know, it, it still does have its problems with crashing, but the mod is sound. What do I mean by uh, balancing issues? If I mentioned that earlier, I don't know if I did, I'm going to mention it now. It does have balancing issues. Now what do I mean by that? Well, I'll get into that a little bit later. Ha <laughs> ha! For now, let's handle this like any normal review and start by going down the list of positives and negatives. However, I want to make sure before I go into these that I, I, I want you guys to know I wholly support this mod and encourage you to play it and to pick up the game and play the game, the vanilla version, if you haven't yet had the chance. I'm not going to go into the specifics of the actual game, other than to tell you that it's a game with adventure elements, RPG elements, strategy elements, and even just a tiny bit of romance, if you try hard enough, and a little bit of comedy, once again, if you try hard enough to find it. I think it's a game, you know, that lovers of RPG and strategy should definitely pick up, it just seems like a no-brainer. Now, let's get on to the pros and cons. I'm going to do the positives first, thank you very much. The game is set in a fantasy world, number one. However, they don't go too far into this fantasy. There are dragons, kinda, as mounts. They're not going around ravaging your forces or, you know, burning down villages. There's no orcs or trolls or goblins, nothing like that. But there are elves and dwarves, so it's kinda like a semi-fantasy world. Or a half-assed fantasy world. <laughs> Uh, number two, unlike the vanilla game, in this mod you can actually enlist into someone's army and fight as a frontline soldier. By doing this, you can work your way up in rank under them while gaining money and more valuable gear the longer you do this, and eventually work your way up to owning your own army and possibly even becoming a lord yourself. Just like in the vanilla game, you can muster your own army and join a faction and work your way up through that faction and then eventually kind of have your own little story plot to encourage you further. And since each faction has its own unique units, and you have ultimate freedom in arranging your army, you could create an army made entirely out of elven archers, dwarven shieldmen, wolf rider cavalry, I mean, that's pretty cool shit, right? I mean, the wolf rider cavalry actually ride wolves. Let me be clear about that. Uh, I believe that was number three. Number four, unlike in vanilla or in other mods of this game, this one allows you to recruit mercenaries for cheap prices. An easy and quick way of mustering up a small army to help you grow your fame until you can join a kingdom and get even stronger troops. The mercenaries aren't the strongest, but they're not the weakest either. They give you just what you're looking for in terms of how much they cost and how much it costs to maintain them. Number five is that the unique items that they have in this world are pretty cool. Unlike in the vanilla version of this game, there are certain quest chains that you can go through which will eventually reward you with unique magical or legendary weapons, which give you some cool stat buffs, you know, they they got some really good stats on themselves based on weaponry, and they just help you to become more powerful, more deadly. They have tons of different items, but the majority favorite is this big old black sword covered in real flames, and I'm not exaggerating, it's, it's a pure black blade, big old two-hander, that has flames coming out of it. It's really cool. Number six... The quests are all meant to do something. One quest can get you a magical weapon, or one quest can help you court the princess of the Elven Kingdom. So if you wanted to marry into royalty, you can do that for two nations in this game. Also, really cool. Number seven. Another positive is the unique individuals and faces for the females in this game. In vanilla, the only unique individuals were the leaders of each nation, and all the women were super ugly. And I don't mean the whole ugly on the outside, beauty on the inside. I mean ugly in and out. And since these characters don't have hardly any personality and don't contribute to the story or strategy or almost anything at all, the only reason why you get married is to have a pretty face near you, basically. I mean, they do end up kind of becoming like a secretary later, but that's that job could easily, easily go to one of your companions. 
but in this mod, it changes all of the female faces to being much better drawn and designed, so that when you get married, not only can they provide some clerical assistance, as I said earlier, but they're also not horrible on the eyes. Also, I wanted to mention the unique characters, as I stated earlier. I want to go more in-depth with that. There are unique individuals who roam across the lands, carrying large hordes of gold or other unique items that can only be obtained by defeating them in battle. Each is powerful with their own unique army of soldiers, and none of them are easy to defeat. My favorite one is called Nibber Hood. Get it? Like Robin Hood? Just read the name backwards? That's the only reason why he's my favorite. Overall, he has low money and a shitty army, but the name is so funny that I remember him apart from all the others. I could probably keep going on the positives, but then I'd just be droning on, and I prefer to stick to the most memorable things that will leave the most impact on you. So, that means that next up is the negatives. So the first one I got for that is the game stability and frame rate issues. This game, it can be highly frustrating at certain times with its low frame rate drops, and it does crash frequently, so save often. As this game's crashing is random and unpredictable, even when looking up clues on how to fix this issue online and then applying these fixes to my game, it still crashes on me unpredictably. And as for the frame rate issues, well, it's pretty bad. Pretty much all the time except when you're fighting. Which, I mean, obviously it could be worse, but when you're not fighting, which is probably 60 to maybe 70% of the game, it dips. All the time. Sometimes the frame rates get so bad you think your game just froze. It is a huge annoyance and will give most people a headache. Number two, in this mod, they introduce a new faction roughly 140 days in, and they are called the Zan Dynasty. Basically, it's a Japanese race introduced into the game wearing samurai armor and whatnot. They will pop up with more forces than any other kingdom in the game, four times as much, and begin conquering castle and city one after the next. This can be highly frustrating for you, and this is the reason why. Let's say you've just spent 100 days in-game working hard for the elven faction. 20 days later, you finally get your own bustling city to rule over in its own unique units and a big old paycheck. You're just starting to fill it with recruits and training them into soldiers and you're really getting pumped up that you can finally start to hoard troops and hoard gold and everything else when suddenly you look down your walls and see a thousand and, you know, not just a thousand, thousands of these Japanese samurai laying siege to your hard-earned city. Do you stand even a remote chance of beating them? Nope. Not even close. So, they take your city. And in doing so, also take the village under your control, and you are left with no territory at all. No place to store your units. No place to hide from a, a big army when after you just suffered an, an attack from another army and your troops are all weak. No big paycheck anymore. All the hard work you've been putting into it goes down the drain. Does the Queen of the Elves ever give you that territory back if reconquered? Nope. Will she ever give you territory equal to what you lost? Nope. So after that happens, you're literally back to square one for another 120 days of trying to gain a city with no guarantee you'll even be able to. I will say, however, that if you change the time the Zan, the Zan, Zan, Zan Dynasty shows up, they'll be much easier to handle and you can better prepare yourself for their arrival. So even that negative is not that bad. Number three, the balancing of the game is simply terrible. You have no idea who's the best at what. When looking up unit types online, you'll get various answers from different people, and even when you put it to the test, you'll get uncertain results. With one exception, I will note down, the elves obviously have the best archers. That's a no-brainer. But besides that, you will hear people tell you, and you will read people tell you that there are roughly four, maybe five different types of units who, or factions who have the best cavalry. You've got the Reich, S, Reich des Dreiken, uh, I'm pretty sure that's German. Uh, you've got the Wolf Knights, the Eagle Knights, the Demon Knights, and some kind of Forest Elves. I can't remember their name. But like I said, trying to figure out who is the best takes a shit ton of work. And not only that, but you can't recruit the Wolf Knights, Eagle Knights, or Demon Knights unless you capture them first or free them from capture after making their faction really love you. It's a giant hassle. Who has the best infantry? Well, normally you'd probably think that it'd either be the Dwarves or the Giants that are in this game. But there again... It's so hard to differentiate which is stronger when you're always seeing them get cut down so fast, even when storming a castle. It just doesn't make any sense. So what I mean when I say balancing is simple. If you were to pick a unit type that a faction specializes in and max your army out with them, let's say Elven Archers for instance since I know those guys are legit, you will also be considered unstoppable. I have conquered heavily guarded castles with 3 to 1 odds against me using only Elven Archers. If that isn't imbalanced, then I don't know what is. Now, number four. Another thing that's in this newer version compared to the older version of this mod is that everyone 
has relations with you. Freaking everyone. Even bandits for goodness sake. Who cares what bandits think? God. But what I mean is, back in the day, you could take a bunch of dwarven units, tell them to use blunt weapons, and go hunt down wolf packs. And by wolf packs, I mean these wolf night packs. You could capture anywhere from 1 to 50 units, and after capturing them, and if your persuasion skill is high enough, you could recruit them into your army and have your own wolf rider knight company. So freaking cool. I loved doing that just because I loved the idea of having my own personal wolf knight army to escort me as I gathered my rank in the kingdom I was serving in. But now, because every freaking faction in this whole damn world has a relationship stat with you, you can't do that anymore. If the faction doesn't like you, you can never have one of their units as your own. And if you think, well, it can't be that hard to make a faction like you, then you're wrong. Why? Because first off, they start off automatically hating you with really low stats. And because all of these smaller non-kingdom factions are consistently attacking the larger nations and you that you might have allied with to gain money and strong troops. And I'm talking about the nations that you sided with. And what are you going to do? Are you going to ignore your wife who is battling wolf knights? Fuck no. Are you going to sit here and just let them beat you over, over, over and over and over again every time they charge at you? No, you're not going to do that either. So it's dumb. I want the old recruiting shit back. Number five. This one's not really that big a deal, but I just wanted to say it because it, it's an, an annoyance to me. No kids. Another mod where you can't have kids. Now, I can kind of understand this. Each day passes by and a year passes you by in like four hours, right? So, you know, it would take a really long time to have a child because four hours for one year multiplied by like 10 years to get a character model for a child on here and you spent like 40 hours I guess ridiculous but it, I still would have enjoyed some form of adoption or something so I could have an heir for my kingdom or so I could just have an heir to the lands that I inherited from the king you know something to make it a little more realistic but like I said not a big thing just something that's always irritated me I hope in Mountain Blade 2 they have something like that number six uh, remember the balancing issues I stated earlier? Well, this is going to go into that a little bit. The Zon Dynasty are too strong. Coming in with large numbers because it's part of the plot? Fine. I can understand that. What really irritates me is after they've been around for a year or so, and every kingdom has already recovered its armies and it's got its fighting strength back and they're starting to fight back, the Zon Dynasty's overall units are far stronger than any other faction. This is really frustrating when you're trying to help your kingdom fight back without losing your super elite units and then watching them get cut down. Number seven, this is going to bounce right off of that because it also really pisses me off. It's always your elite units who die first. That's horseshit. Why is it that when I go into battle with 150 men, 10 of them are elite archers fully upgraded, and they're the ones who die in battle? Aren't they supposed to be fucking elites? Why, why are they, why the fuck are they dying like frontline recruits? My, my recruit, my recruits live, but my veterans with better armor and gear die. That shit is backwards, and I would love to see that shit fixed somehow. Number eight, owning your own kingdom is a bitch to rule. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. I cannot stand owning my own kingdom, and yet that's the overall point of the game, to create your own kingdom and conquer everything. Yet it's so stupid, I hate it, I hate it. The overall point is to make positive relations with fellow lords around the world, train up your own personal companions to be fit leaders, and then after you start building your kingdom, you grant villages, cities, and castles to your companions or lords who agreed to join you. But here's the serious downside to this. Every single time you give land to one lord, every other lord hates you. So let's say you gave a city, a village, and a castle to one lord due to his hard work and tireless effort. Then another lord joins you. Well, you have to give him some territory, right? Else he's going to leave and go somewhere else. Well, as soon as you do, the lord, the lord I mentioned previously, who owns one of each, will suddenly hate your guts. It's like, fuck you, you greedy asshole. And not only that, but if you're trying to distribute your territory fairly among your lords and one lord gets pissed enough, he will completely leave your kingdom to join another one and keep the land you gave him. So half your kingdom is gone just because some asshole was pissed off that you didn't give him every inch of land. It's so fucking stupid, I hate it so much, and I wish this mechanic was completely removed permanently. It makes it impossible to conquer the whole kingdom. Anyway, I'm going to calm down a little bit because that one point really did piss me off, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this down a little bit. That's all I've got for the pros and cons. So, there is some good and some bad on both sides. But even after my bitching and my little fit there, I still feel that the good are way bigger than the bad. The bad can just be annoying and frustrating at times, but only rarely. The good that I mentioned are there all the time and work fairly well. 
and the mod developers even added some extra options to tweak the game that help you to set up the type of game you want to play and how you want to do it. And by doing that, it minimizes your frustration at some of the gaming mechanics that were originally developed here. So I gotta give points to the developers for this foresight. The game is highly addicting and it has units for almost anyone out there to pick and fall in love with. It has an encouraging style of play so that you can work hard and be rewarded with gold, a city, or unique units, or unique items for that matter. All these come together to help you personalize and create your own character, your own army, your own city, and possibly even your own kingdom to rule over if you're willing to work really hard at it. I love the idea of this mod, and if they could just fix some of those negatives I mentioned up above, I'd give this mod a 10 out of 10. But as of now, I'm giving this mod an 8 out of 10. The only reason why it's not a 9 out of 10 is because this mod's stability and frame rate drops are out of, the world, out of this world bad. I hope an update comes out soon to fix these because if this mod ever does get to be smooth and stable, it'd be a fantastic mod, almost perfect for this game, almost better than the original vanilla game itself. I can't fully help you to understand the game, to really understand what I'm talking about. To do that, you're actually going to have to go play it. But with this video, you can kind of see how the gameplay works and get a feel for it. I hope that my video was informative and helped some of you understand it a bit more and maybe help convince some of you to support this mod and even support this game or the sequel that's coming out soon. After all, it's clear that a lot of work has gone into this mod and it was really well done. So that's it for this mod review everybody. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Please let me know what you think in the comments below and if you'd be so kind as to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and hit that little bell button and help my channel grow, I'd be very appreciative of that. Thanks so much for watching, and as always, I can't wait to see you on my next adventure, so until then, I bid you farewell.